Good morning. I suddenly had an uh, episode of deja vu. <laughs> I've never been a pastor at a church that does two services. And uh, if you don't know what that feels like, let me try to share how I'm feeling right now. Felt like I just ran a marathon, and I crossed the finish line only to have someone tap me on the shoulder and said, oh, by the way, sir, you have to run all the way back, too. Um, I want to take a moment and thank you uh, for what you guys did for me and my family last week. We felt so welcomed by what you did uh, for, for my family and for myself. I'm excited that they're back today. Not only my, my wife and my child, my, par- my, my parents, my dad and my mom, but also my sister and her uh, little girl, Noel. So I'm doing my part in growing this community. So um, I also wanted to uh, just uh, take a moment to poke fun at Pastor Godso. He took advantage last week to mention and remind me that I am the shortest pastor on the pastoral staff, even though I come from a church that I was the tallest pastor. And then I I just asked if someone could please tell me how a man of his stature can fit in the car that he has. It blew my mind. That car is it's a little Fiat something, but it is so cute, and he is so big. I, I, still, I still don't know how that happens. But. Uh, I love working with the pastoral staff. I love working with the staff. We're going to have a good time together. Uh, we're going to get to know each other, and I'm going to start today by telling you something a little bit about myself and what I love. I love photography. I love videography. Uh, Roger and I just hit it off. Uh, A.V. Rogers, uh, Roger. And um, I love it because when you see a picture, it, it tells you a story, a thousand words in just one photograph. There's a lot of different types of pictures that people like to take. You have macro photographers who like to take things really close up, nightscape photographers, hyperlapses, time lapse, of course. Young people love to take selfies on their phones, but I love to take portraits. I love to take group shots. I love people's faces. People's faces, looking at, into someone's face, you can tell a lot about a person by looking at their face. You can tell uh, it, you know, their gender relatively their age, relatively speaking. You can look at their face and you can see the wrinkles of of memories and hard times in their life. A a face can can give you a story, looking at someone's face, can tell you a story of a thousand words without saying a single thing. I found out that there's a new form, I don't know how new it is, but there, it's new to me, a new form of couples therapy, marriage therapy, marriage counselors do this, where they take a couple and if they're having issues together, they sit them down and they say, okay, for the next five minutes, all I want you to do is look at each other. Don't do anything else, just stare into each other's face. Apparently, this is very therapeutic. The, the New York Times did an experiment with eight people, then YouTube got onto it. You can go and watch this video. It's quite funny, actually. They took different couples, one that's never met e- each other a day in their lives, another couple that was on their fourth date, and then there was another couple that's been married for 55 years. And it's quite remarkable what happens when you just sit for four minutes, that's what they had them do, just to look, just to gaze into the face of someone you love. So here's your homework (laughs) for this week. Try it. Go home, sit down, someone you love, someone you care about, and just look at their face for a few minutes. See what happens. You never know. (laughs) In the Bible, there's a story that I want to talk about this morning, and it's a very interesting story. It's a story that you know well, but it's a story of two brothers who had two very different faces from one another. If you read their stories, uh, I mean, it, the, the stuff that, that's in their stories could put many of the Hollywood films to shame that are out today. I mean, it's full of everything. Everything. War, intrigue, lust, rape, but everything. War. Does anybody know who I'm talking about, by the way? Who am I talking about? Old Testament, yes? 
For 20 years, he didn't know anything about his family. And then Genesis chapter 35 verse 1 gives us an incredible key to understanding this story at a much deeper level. Open your Bibles with me to Genesis chapter 35. Genesis chapter 35. I normally do PowerPoints, but today we're going to be diving into the Word of God. Genesis chapter 35. Genesis chapter 35 and verse 1. I'm reading from the New King James Version. It says, Genesis 35, verse 1, Then God said to Jacob, Arise and go to Bethel and dwell there and make an altar there to God, who appeared to you when you fled from the face of Esau, your brother. Now, some of your Bible translations has that word face there. Some of them don't. But in the Hebrew, it's there. And I want you to pay, pay close attention to this because this is the theme, this is the motif of this entire story. And when you see this, by the end of the sermon today, you're going to see this. It's amazing. This is the theme, the key to unlock this story, to understand it in a much more profound and deeper way, uh, especially Genesis chapter 32 and 33, the story of Jacob and Esau. Basically, Jacob was haunted by the face of his brother Esau. Everywhere he looked, he just ran. He just wanted to go in the opposite direction, to run as far as he could from the face of his brother. And after 20 long and hard years, he decides, I want to go home. But he knows that in order to go home, he will have to see the face of his brother once again. And this is the tension in the story. What's going to happen when Jacob comes face to face with his brother Esau? Beginning in verse uh, chapter 32, rather, God reassures Jacob. Uh, Jacob doesn't kind of just walk away from Laban. He, Laban. he runs. He does it secretly. And God intervenes and they patch things up because Laban went after him and says, what are you doing? And there's a long story there that we won't get into this morning. But God, on this journey, after all this happens, he shows Jacob a camp of angels. And this, this encourages Jacob. So Jacob has an idea. Look, I'm going to start to send messengers off to Jacob, uh, to Esau, and, and just to let him know, hey, I'm coming home. Me and all my family and all my goods and everybody's coming with me. I'm coming home. What's interesting is that the messengers come back with a message for Jacob. Chapter 32 and verse 6. It says, Then the messengers returned to Jacob, saying, We came to your brother Esau, and he also is coming to meet you. And 400 men are with him. We can easily see why the very next verse begins with these words. So Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed. I mean, wouldn't you be scared? I'd be scared. I don't know what 400 men, what are they coming to do? Are they coming to give me a welcome like you guys did last week to me? Are they coming to kill me? Are they, what, what are they going to do? I don't know what 400, why is he coming with 400 men? And what does Jacob do? What's his reaction to this? When he sees the reality of his situation, his human instincts kick in. Instead of praying to God, his humanity kicks in. And to Jacob, his humanity means to start to divide things. We're going to see that very clearly now. Look at the rest of verse 7. And he divided the people that were with him, and the flocks, and the herds, and the camels, into two companies. Look why he does this. Very next verse. And he said, if Esau comes to the one company and attacks it, then the other company which is left will escape. Cruel. cruel. Think about it. Who would you put in the first group? In Germany, during, the war, during World War II, uh, in the concentration camps, especially Auschwitz, when they used to play cruel games, mind games on Jews. For instance, 
when a mother would come to the camp and she had two kids, there would be two paths, one to the concentration camp and the other to the gas chamber. And they would make the mother choose which child goes down which path. This is ridiculous. This is cruel. And we see Jacob doing the same thing. If you were in Jacob's shoes, who would you put in the first group? We know later what he actually did. He put Rachel and Joseph, the people who he loved most, in the back group because he wanted to save them. And who does he put in the first group? He puts his servants and their families. This, this is a little cruel. But you see the humanity of the people in the Bible. And to me, that's encouraging because I think that many times we look at people in the Bible and we think that some, for some reason they're these holy people who could never make a mistake. And to me, it tells me, look, just because you make a mistake doesn't mean that God has abandoned you. After this, let's give Jacob some credit because he does do the right thing. He takes a moment and regathers himself and says, okay, let me pray. And from chapter 32, verses 9 to 12, you have a beautiful prayer that Jacob says. We won't have time to go into it this morning, but maybe we could do it over a prayer meeting sometime because it's a, it's a fantastic prayer. And he finally does the right thing. But there goes Jacob again. Following this prayer, the Bible says that he starts to divide again. And this time, he doesn't divide people. He divides his possessions. He starts dividing his, his riches. And he decides, hey, if I start sending these ahead of myself to Esau, uh, but why? Why is he doing this? He's taking control again of his own situation. The Bible tells us why. Look at chapter 32, verse 20. He says, starting at the, the second sentence, for he said, I will appease him with the present that goes before me, and afterward I will see his, what? Face. Perhaps he will accept me. Remember, we're going to come back to this theme of face. And this is where it gets interesting. How many times does this word have the word face in it? In my translation, once. I went back to the original Hebrew, and guess how many times? Not once. Not twice, not three times, but four times in one verse, the word face is used. Now, anytime the, word, oh, anytime the Bible has a verse with a word that appears four times, you know it's trying to tell you something. Listen to this verse. I translated it straight from the Hebrew. This is what it says. This is the reason Jacob's sending all these gifts. I will cover his face with these gifts that go before my face. And afterwards, when I see his face, perhaps he will lift up my face. So you know why he's sending these gifts. He's trying to cover the face of his brother Esau. He's thinking that Esau has an angry, bitter, hateful face. And he's sending gifts so that in some way, maybe he can just cover that face and change it into something more loving, more gracious, more kind. That's what he wants. As evening falls in the desert on this, in this journey that Jacob is making through the desert, Jacob wants to be alone. He has done everything he could. Throughout the day, he's been dividing and dividing, and suddenly the Bible says that there's a man that appears. Verse 24 says, Then Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of day. Now, I don't know. If you have ever seen a wrestling match before, uh, I had the privilege of, uh, when I grew up in Cambridge, there's a member in our church that is a gold medal wrestler and, uh, from the Czech Republic, I believe. And I asked him once, you know, how, how long does a wrestling match last? He said, oh, about nine minutes. And we get really tired. And actually recently, over the years, they've shortened it to five or six minutes because it's such a physically demanding sport. And here we have a, a word, especially in the Hebrew that it's, that it's using here, it, it literally means to, they, cover, they were covered in dust. They were close, embracing each other. This is not like those pictures we've seen about this uh, where they're standing there and God is holding the hands of Jacob and they're just kind of going back and forth and... Ooh, you know, who's going to win? 
This is an all-out brawl rolling around in the dirt. And what surprises me is that Jacob lasted all night. That's incredible. Now, something that is important here to understand is that Jacob was not wrestling against God. He was wrestling with God. And there's a very interesting difference between that. Because many times I think that, yes, it's, it's not a good idea to wrestle against God. But there are times in our lives when we come to the place where we wrestle with God. And I want to let you know that's okay. Do you know why? Because when you wrestle with someone, you are in the closest possible position to them. When I used to wrestle back in grade school, I mean, whenever a, a guy would have me in a headlock under his arm, I mean, I would be like right up in there, like that funky smells and everything. And your ear is up against their chest. You can hear their heartbeat. Please don't buy into the fact that God has abandoned you when you hear news that one of your loved ones died or that you have cancer. Or you go to bed crying with your face in your pillow because your kids are somewhere off in, in, in university and they don't care a thing about God. And you wrestle with God. Do not buy into the fact that that is evil and God has abandoned you. God is closer to you than you can ever possibly imagine. It was only after this wrestling match that Jacob has with God that he was able to surrender. Before this, he was always trying to be in control of his life, and God wanted to see if he was ready to surrender. His name even means the one who grasped, and from his birth he was fighting, always fighting for what he wanted. And now he's fighting against God, or with God, I should be careful. Finally, God breaks the silence in the morning and says, Jacob, let me go. And what does Jacob tell him? No, I'm not letting you go. I'm not letting you go until you bless me. Have you ever been in that moment when you are wrestling with God and you do not want to get up from the floor until you say, God, I need you to bless me now? What was Jacob wanting? What blessing was he wanting? In, in my mind, I'm thinking that he just really wanted the assurance that God is with him, that God forgives him, that God is going to protect him. That's what he really wanted. God, he's begging God, please bless me before I go. And God asks him a very strange question. You remember what he asks him? What's your name? That's right. You're telling me that God has been wrestling this guy the whole night and he has no idea who he's wrestling? Question wasn't for God. But why did he ask him that? Think about this. Let me ask you this question. When was the last time Jacob was asked, who are you? What was he doing? He was lying. He was not willing to let go. He was not willing to surrender, to come to grips with who he was. He was a liar and a cheater and a grasper of things. And he was stealing his brother's birthright in front of his dad. And at that moment, God asked him, who are you? Are you ready to accept who you are? Are you willing to surrender so that I can bless you? And many times, could it be? Could it be that we ask God for things and he is more than willing to bless us, but we are not willing to surrender? He's waiting. He wants to bless us, but are you willing to surrender your life to him? After Jacob was ready to admit, God blesses him. He changes his name. He says, look, you're ready. I'm, you're no longer a grasper of things. I'm going to give you a different name. Your name will be he who wrestles with God. That's what Israel means. What an incredible story. And after uh, Jacob realizes what happened, he builds a monument. This is so neat. He builds a monument and he names the place. There's a, here's a good quiz question. What name did he name that place? Peniel. Let's read it together. Look in uh, chapter 32, verse 30. Chapter 32, verse 30 says, So Jacob called the name of the place Peniel. Do you know what Peniel means? 
That is a, 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 a two, it's made up of two Hebrew words, panaim and eil. Eil is God and panaim is what? Guess what it is? Face. Again, we touch on this word face. It is key to understanding the story in a completely new light. He names the place the face of God. Why? Look at uh, chapter, uh, the rest of that, 32 uh, verses uh, 30 says, For I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. What an incredible statement. I hope one day I can say that. <laughs> I want to be able to see God face to face. Not a picture of him, but the physical face of God. And finally, as the day breaks after he's named the place Peniel, the face of God, the day has arrived where he will once again see the face of his brother. But because Jacob saw God's face, he now has the strength to see the face of his brother. And Jacob is walking. Chapter 33 now, verses 1 says, Now Jacob lifted his eyes and looked, and there Esau was coming, and with him four hundred men. Uh-oh. The next word is so. <laughs> I'm afraid what comes after this. Let's see. So he divided the children among Leah, Rachel, and the two maidservants. And, you know, when I read this, I, I almost want to chuckle to myself because I think, man, Jacob, you just saw the face of God. You had this whole moment, and then you see the reality of your situation. It, you resort, resort right back to your old sinful self. But then I stop to think and look over my life. How many times have we been so close to God only in a few short hours or days or weeks to resort right back to our old habits and our old routines? Even though Jacob begins to divide Again, something has changed because the Bible says that now as he's approaching Esau, he starts to bow seven times. And instead of being at the back of the pack, he is now in the front of the pack. And as he's doing this bowing and lifting up, bowing and lifting up, seeing Esau with 400 men coming towards him, Esau runs to him, which was illegal in those days for the head of the home. That was very awkward. But it, show, it shows us that Esau didn't care about his dignity. He didn't care about what other people thought of him. He wanted to see the face of his brother once again. 30, chapter 33, verse 4 says, But Esau ran to meet him and embraced him and fell on his neck and kissed him and they wept. Do you hear the emotion coming out? All the history, all the hurt, all of the, 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 the heartache that was between these guys all started melting away, just coming up out of these tears. And I think everybody there knew what was going on. After some time, we don't know how long it was, Esau looks up and he sees all the things that Jacob brought with him. And he says, what are these for? Jacob said, they're yours. They're my gifts. Take them. And Esau, what does he respond? He says, no, no, no. I have what I need. You keep them. And then we arrive at the culmination point of this story. And I'm so glad you came this morning because this verse right here changed the way I looked at this story forever. Look at this verse. Chapter 33, verse 10. And Jacob said, No, please. If I have now found favor in your sight, then receive my present from my hand, inasmuch as I have seen your face as though I had seen the face of God. Now, I thought that Jacob just saw the face of God the night before. How could he say, look at his, his brother and say, your face reminds me of the face of God? How could he say that? Here's what I believe. Jacob saw the same characteristics that he saw in the face of God now in the face of his brother. What did he see in God's face? He saw God's love. He saw God's compassion, God's forgiveness, God's love, God's mercy, God's grace 
towards him. And now he sees the same thing in the face of his brother. Let me conclude with this. When people look at your face, what do they see? When people see your face, what do they see? A rabbi once asked a group of students, you know, they like to be very philosophical about their questions. He asked, you know, tell me, how do you know when darkness has gone and the light has come and the, the night has disappeared and the light has arrived? How do you know? The students were puzzled. They didn't really know how to answer that question, uh, but they kind of schemed together. And one of them raised their hands and he says, okay, sure, go ahead. He says, oh, I know. When there's just enough light where you can make out the difference in the distance between a tree and a man. Okay, he didn't like that answer. He said, no, that's not the answer. Another one was kind of catching on. They said, okay, how about when you can tell the difference between a man and a woman? No, he didn't like that either. Another, a third one raised his hands. How about when you can make out the difference between two types of trees, an olive tree and a fig tree? He said, no, that's not it. Okay, rabbi, okay, please tell us. How do you know? And the rabbi looks at them and says, you know when the night has gone and the day has come, when darkness has disappeared and the light is here, when you can recognize in the face of your neighbor the face of a brother. That's deep. I like that. But I think this inspired story that God has given us in his word about Jacob and Esau takes it one step further. It tells us the light has come and the night has gone. Darkness has disappeared and day has come. When your neighbor, and then let me be very real here this morning, when your husband, when your wife, when your children, when your coworker, when your classmates, when your students, when your fellow church members and the guests that come through that door, when they can recognize in your face the face of God.